Hello, everyone, and welcome back. We're going to continue on with our discussion of looping. So as usual, you can feel free to follow along or you can just follow the video. I am going to share my screen with you. Let's bring up the slides. And so we've been talking about looping um, and uh, using the while loops. So this is another kind of flow control, which does fit in with what we've been talking about the last week, which was using the if statements. But we are now going to see how flow control can be modulated with the while loops. Um, and we've seen the simple ones, but there are some other alternate syntaxes that you can encounter with the looping. So let's continue on with while loops with break. Break is a Python keyword that terminates the execution of, of loops. It overrides the branch guard. So once you encounter the break, so I'm thinking about that imaginary pointer, once that goes along and then encounters the break command, then it is going to stop the execution of the loop, whether or not the branch guard is true. It doesn't matter. It allows the termination of the loop from within the loop because the break someplace. Usually this is guarded with some kind of an if law because you don't want to just have break in your loop. So if you just had break in your loop, there wouldn't really be any point in the loop because if there was nothing to guard it, it would just go through the first time. And as soon as it encountered break, the loop would terminate. So it would not really be looping. So usually the setup we see is that you have while and you have a branch guard and then you have an if statement inside the body of that loop that would um, that would have an, some kind of a condition that could be met under certain circumstances that would cause your loop to terminate. So this is an example of your syntax. You'd have your initialization as we talked about before. Four. Um, and so you need to do that because your loop variable needs to be initialized just as it did before. Then you would have your, your block statement and, and whatever statements you have, that's what the dot, dot, dot signifies. And then you would have if some condition is met. So if that condition is met, then the code inside of here will execute. Otherwise, your loop is going to continue. So this um, is protecting the break, which would then terminate the execute of the loop as soon as you encounter this break. You could have as many things here up to your break point as you wish. Usually you would do this kind of thing, like if you want to check for some kind of an error, um, like some user makes some input and they did something they're not supposed to do, you could check for some particular condition that was met and you would probably have some print statements in here that would print to the user, like you shouldn't do this. And then your um, block statements continue on. So your conditional can be inside the body at any point. And then you would also need to be sure to increment your loop variable so that it goes back to the top of your loop. And don't forget, of course, you can put your loops inside of functions and we should do that. I'm not showing it embedded in a, in a function, but um, oftentimes that's how you would program that. So that brings me to this interesting point. There are in fact two ways that the loop could terminate. So if you have a branch guard and you have a break, then either one of those has the propensity to break that loop. It's possible it could terminate either way. Um, it could terminate when the branch guard becomes false. So if the branch guard becomes false and we get back up to the top and we check that branch guard and it's false, then as usual, the loop will terminate. But also if you encounter that break, so if you don't go through the body of the if statement that's guarding the branch, then you're, you're not going to terminate. But if it does encounter the break, then that's it. Um, you're going to have a break. So let's actually just take a look at how that might actually work. Uh, this is a bit of code. It's called uh, it's a function, and it's called uh, my loop. And it's not going to take any input, and it's not going to return uh, any meaningful input. It's going to return none. So the type of that is none type, and I'm using none type to indicate there's nothing in here. This demonstrates the two ways that the 
loop code terminates. So we're going to need to initialize i, but notice that we're actually initializing i in a different way. Instead of just having i equal some fixed value, we're actually going to prompt the user to input an i. So i equals input, please provide an integer. And we've seen the coercion functions to convert something that you wish to be an integer. Remember, we could have also done composition here, which is fine. You can do it either way. But here I have chosen to do it in the two-step fashion. So now I have an I, some index, which also conveniently is the first letter of integer, which is going to be used in my loop. So we see that I also appears in the branch card. That's why we needed to initialize it. Otherwise, this I would not be defined. So we're saying while I is less than five, uh, we should do the looping, right? So this is our first condition, if i is less than five. So if the user has input um, something larger than five, then the loop will not execute, right? Because this is the branch guy, right? So if they type 10, do you see that this will not be true and the whole thing inside the while loop will not execute. So it protects even the if and the print, all of these things are inside the loop. So you would simply just not execute the loop. But if they do type something less than five, if i is exactly equal to negative two, we're going to print magic number and break. So if they do type that, specific one or if i becomes equal to negative two then we have this magic number we have the special condition being met and the break would be encountered and so the execution of the loop would terminate it so happens there's nothing after the loop either so also then the function will just return none if they type a number that's not equal to two or the current value of i is not equal to two maybe it's three then what will happen is it will say if i equals equals two no that's false so it'll just print i equals and then it will increment i to the next value and go back to the top of the loop so you see that there are two ways that this could end either i is uh, less than five uh well okay so i mean either i is less than five and, and the loop continues and then when i uh, equals or is greater than five the the loop will terminate because this branch guard will become false or the other thing that could happen is i becomes exactly equal to two as it passes through here and then it will break so let's take a look at some different possibilities please provide an integer and they type two okay so we go to do, do, do load in the function and notice I'm calling it function interactively. Okay, so we uh, come along and we say, please provide the integer, which is this right here. They type two. I um, the i becomes an integer in this line right here. Um, then we get to the while line. So i is two. Is that less than five? Well, yes, it is. Is i exactly equal to negative two? No, it's not. So we skip this branch and we print i equals and the current value of i, which is two. So we do that and we increment the i, our loop variable by one by augmented assignment. And we go back to the top of the loop. Now i is going to be three because we just augmented it. So is three less than five? Yes. Is three exactly equal to negative two? No. So we go here, print i equals and then the current value, which is three. So we get this and we increment i again. Now it is four. Is four less than five? Yes. Is i exactly equal to negative two? No. So we go here, print i equals i four. And then we increment i by one. And so now it's five. Is five less than five? No, the branch guard is false now. And so the execution terminates. All right, so we see that this one terminated because the branch guard became false, which is like the termination of regular loops. But you never know what's going to happen. Right? You could ask. As soon as you start asking users for input, they could type anything. All right, so let's see what's going to happen. 
uh, this time around. So we come along, we read in the definition of, of how to do my loop. That's great. We do our function call interactively, which starts the execution of this. I equals input, please provide an integer, and they type negative five. Okay. Now we're going to convert that to an integer. And while i is less than negative five, is uh, while i being negative five is less than five, um, which is true. If uh, i equals equals negative two, no, it's negative five. So we skip that. We're going to print i equals and its current value, which is negative five. Augment by one. Remember, a negative number plus one walks at one towards the positive direction. So it'll now be negative four. Is negative four less than five? It sure is, but it's not equal to negative two. So we'll print i equals and negative four increment by one to make i now equal to negative three. And we go back up to the top. Is negative three exactly equal to two? It is not. So we skip and we print i equals negative three, the current value increment to negative two. Is negative two less than five? Yes. Is negative two exactly equal to negative two? Aha, uh -huh. yes it is. So we will print out the message magic number and we have break. So although the branch guard technically is still true, it terminated because we encountered the break. And so we have seen now that this loop could, the same code can terminate either because we have um, made the branch guard become false or because we have encountered the break. Let's take a look at another example here. We have a while with an accumulator break example. This is a running total example. The idea is you keep adding something and we're going to continue adding that along just like an accumulator. So this is going to take a none type and it's going to return float and it's going to compute the running sum. So that means as we add something on, it's going to sum that as we go. So we're going to need to initialize our accumulator. We'll, call it, we'll just go ahead and let this um, be while, while true. Okay, so can the branch guard ever be false? No, because it's true. We'll talk about this in a minute. X equals input, enter the number to sum or type done to exit. So if X is equal to the word done, it will print goodbye and then it will break. So you see that this terminates the entry of the data else. Accumulator plus equals augmented assignment and coercion float of X. Here's your coercion right here. Return the accumulator. The grand total is, and here's our running sum. So let's see how this would actually execute. So as we go along, we uh, we read in our function and it doesn't execute until we encounter the function call, which is embedded inside of the print. This is, um, this is going to now call our function and we have the run some function call right here. Doesn't send anything up, which is fine because it's not looking for anything. The accumulator will be equal to zero while true x equals input. Enter the number to sum or type done to exit. So we get the message over here. And don't forget the slash and this new line. So that's why we end up typing on the next line. So let's suppose they type one. Okay, so um, is X exactly equal to done? No, it is not. So that means we get into the else branch. Accumulate equals float of X a plus equals a float of x. So this means we're going to do zero plus one to increment that. Then we go back up to the top of the loop. Why is it we don't do the return ACC? Because that's indented out as far as the while. So we're stuck inside the loop right now. While true, okay. X equals input, enter the number to sum, done to exit. Okay, so they type two. Is two exactly equal to done? Nope. So the accumulator will add on to our growing number. So we have uh, one plus zero. So now we have um, one plus two. So now it's three. Back to the top, while true, could it ever be false? No. Enter a number to sum, done to exit. If X is exact, and they type three. If X is equal to done, which it's not, 
So we get to else. So now we're adding three to the growing accumulator, which also has the value of three. So now it's six. And then we go back to the top while true. Enter a number to sum, done to exit, and they type done. Ah, okay. So I guess they're done typing in the numbers. Is x exactly equal to done? Yes, it is. They just typed it right there. So it's going to print goodbye, which it does here. And now it is going to break. So when we break, we jump out of the while true loop, which means we go to whatever's outside. Well, where is that flow control pointer? It's inside the function. We're still in the function, but we're not inside of the loop. The next thing we encounter in the function is to return the accumulator. So we return the current value of the accumulator, which is six. Why is it that we didn't get an integer? That is because we have the coercion here to float. All right, so we get that back and here is our total six and that's how that works. So that was a bit premature on the while true, so I did, but I did want you to see how that is uh, cycling through. Let's actually take a look at the while true break setup. A Boolean expression may be used for the branch guard, but recall that Python will evaluate the value of the expression. Therefore, the expression could take the form of the Boolean itself, meaning you could have while and literally put true there instead of an expression that would evaluate either to true or false. While true loops can use break to terminate execution, it is useful for checking user input. So the syntax looks something like this, while true, and then you have the body, and then you would have a conditional, and then you would have break. While true loops do not need a loop variable, whereas simple branch guards contain the Boolean expression, the while true loops have a branch guard that is always true because it simply says while true. How could it be anything besides true? There is no variable in the branch guard because it's just while true. So the loop variable is not needed. Here's another example for us to consider. This is called validate input. This is going to test the user uh, input to see if they have followed the instructions. So this is going to take any input in the input parameter. It's going to take it by, again, using the input command. So nothing is here. And so the correct designation here is none type because there's nothing um, coming in through the parentheses. And then the output will be stir a string. So it's going to return a string. And so the idea here is that we have a multiple choice problem. Um, choice equals input. Please pick one, A, B, or C, right? So as humans, we see that, okay, they're supposed to type the letter A, B, or C. If choice is exactly equal to A, so you see here what we're doing is we're actually having a multi way multi-way um, ex expression, right? If choice equals equals A or choice equals equals B or choice equals equals C, all the things that they are allowed to type, we will break. Else it will print error, that was not a valid choice. Please pick A, B, or C, return choice. So let's just get a sense of how exactly this is working. What is the mechanism of this thing? So do you see that if they pick something besides A, B, or C, I mean, you never know what they're going to type. Maybe they type, I don't know, Q. All right, what are you going to do? All right, is Q um, any of these choices, A, B, or C? No, it is not. So what it's going to do is it's going to go to else, right? Because it's not one of the correct ones. Else it will print error that was not a valid choice. Please pick A, B, or C. Then we go back up to the while true loop and it says, okay, um, please pick one, A, B, or C. And so if they type something else, maybe this time they type X. What are you gonna do with these people, you know? So is choice A, B, or C? No, they typed X. So we go on to else and print error. That was not a valid choice. Please pick A, B, or C. And we go back to the top, to the wild true. And then it says, please pick one A, B, or C. And you know, maybe then they finally get the clue. Oh, I'm supposed to type A, B, or C. And they type A. And then what will happen? Well, then we'll get to this if block right here. If choices equal equal to, oh, it does equal A. Yeah, okay, that's true. So then what will happen is it will break because we will enter into the if block. A valid response was given, break. 
So we will then jump out of the while true loop. We don't jump out of the function, but we jump out of the while true loop. And then we get to this point return choice. So do you see that they may have selected incorrect choices, Q, X, and A, but because it got overwritten, it only knows about A because that's the only one that's left in the variable table. So choice is now equal to A, and so it returns that choice. Do you see that this will not allow the function to pass on to the next, well, well to exit with the returns, unless the user exactly types A, B, or C, exactly the choices that you want it to choose from. This is a really good way to validate user input and that can be very helpful for you in your projects. So then when they finally do type something, it returns the choice. Here's our function call and this is using composition. And so it will output um, the what got returned into the print state which will then say congratulations you picked and then whatever validate input has given us so if they finally picked a it would do that so here's just an example of this actually cycling through this please pick one a b or c and they type d and like we were saying when they type something that's wrong this will be false so we'll go on to the else and the else will print about the error which we have here please pick a b or c and then we go back to the top and it prompted to pick A, B, or C, and then they typed A, and it says, congratulations, you picked A, because this will be, um, because this will be true. So it will break, and we will return the, the current value of choice right here. All right, well then, I hope that that has been helpful for you to understand some of the variations of the while loops. We will see that and a few more notes about the while loops in our next meeting. We'll see you next time. Bye.